Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the last of the talks for, for this week. And this afternoon, I want to look at fisheries, aquaculture, food security relationships. So we're going to think about fisheries and aquaculture in the context of, of food security. I mentioned earlier this week that food security has returned to the top of development policy agenda. And a lot of development funding, um, development assistance, government programming, and so on, is turning to questions of food security, uh, nutrition, and health. And fisheries have a part to play in this arena, but the fisheries sector has often not been very well integrated with food security policy. And everybody talks about fish being healthy food, but there is not much translation of that basic statement into a policy for fisheries that's coherent with nutrition and health policy. And likewise, many nutrition, major nutrition and health policies don't include fish. They deal with largely staple crops um, and with diversified nutrition, um, supplemental feeding and other issues, and even so-called food-based so food -based strategies for nutrition and health uh, don't explicitly include fish that often. And where they do, they don't consider the limitations of, of fishery production, and they don't therefore integrate with fisheries management and with aquaculture development. So this is an attempt really to try to pull together these two rather separate worlds of food security and health policy uh, and fisheries and aquaculture development policy. Um, the main sources for this talk are two reports uh, that I've done, one of which is, is published in about 2011. Um, and the other one, which is still has limited uh, internal distribution. One was funded by OECD, um, and the other one by the Rockefeller Foundation. And the work in this and some of the analysis where I haven't credited it elsewhere is, is original analysis that's come out of, of this uh, set of papers. So what I want to talk about first is to outline the contribution that fish and uh, other aquatic source foods make to food security. I then want to re-examine in some cases and examine for the first time in others critical food secu security policy arenas and debates. Um, thinking particularly about the ways that aquaculture is developing, the uh, options for fisheries governance reform, um, seafood fish trade, all of those three we've covered to some degree, so I'm going to recap over them just briefly and nutrition, health, and food policy, which we haven't so far dealt with. Um, I know some of you are food scientists, um, food technologists, and nutritionists, so some of this will, uh, will be familiar territory to you. Um, and I propose at the end reframing fisheries and aquaculture as part of the food system. Now, we talked about frameworks yesterday and showed how, depending on how you framed an issue, it brought into focus some issues and left others behind. Now, my contention is that so far, fisheries in particular, wild fisheries, has been framed largely as an environmental management issue, and particularly so in recent years. Whereas at one time there was development, economic development, and fisheries was part of that. Um, in the last decade or so, it's been strongly influenced by uh, an environmental and conservation agenda, and that's really where people think of fisheries when they, when they think of it at all. Um, ocean conservation is and, and coastal management is is the way that fisheries are, are framed um, and as I said fish, fish the fishery sector is often missing from considerations of the of the global food system so if you look at the predictions for uh, if, is there enough food for to feed nine billion people by 2050 often you'll see projections of meat consumption you'll see projections of the ma major staples uh, what you seldom see is, is projections of, of fish and the role that fish play in that system, although that's beginning to change. So let's go back to basics first, um, defining what we mean by food and nutrition security. The definition of food security is there. Um, it exists when all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life. 
Now, the first word is the one that people usually concentrate on, sufficient food, hence all the measures of food security in terms of calorie counts and, um, you know, are people getting enough food? Now, more recently, the debate has shifted more towards the safety and nutritional value of food and not just on calorie counts because, by and large, the, the global agricultural uh, industrial food production system has been very successful at producing large quantities of calories cheaply. So now we have so-called energy-dense foods, refined carbohydrates, white flour, white maize flour, sugar, um, corn syrup, these kinds of products which are in a lot of processed food and also provide this, the staple um, food, rice um, and, and, and wheat and so on in most people's diets. And the supplies of these have greatly increased globally during the last 50 years and sort of major um, famines based on insufficient production are a, a thing of the past really. Um, there are other reasons why famines still occur but it's seldom an inability to produce food. It's sometimes problems with its distribution, with people's rights of access to it, with so-called food entitlements. Um, but there is clearly a continuing nutrition deficit around the world, both under and over nutrition, and we'll look into these things shortly, uh, which is why people talk increasingly about nutrition security rather than just food. Um, and nutrition security is, is defined here, and it's about adequate consumption of micronutrient-rich foods. And micronutrients are vitamins, amino acids, essential um, amino acids, um, minerals, so things like vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and minerals, iron in particular, iron deficiency is, is a major uh, global nutrition issue, and so on. And the, the foods that are rich in micronutrients generally are not the staple foods that provide us with most of our calories. They're the micronutrient-rich animal source foods um, and the leafy vegetables, the pulses, nuts, and fruits. And these are really important. What is a pulse? A pulse is a bean or a lentil or um, those kinds of things. Leg leg Legumes, yeah. Legumes, yeah. Legumes is the, the, the kind of science word, and this is more the food group culinary word. Um, but these are crucial to prevent diseases, ensuring appropriate child development, and preventing future diet-related diseases, so chronic um, malnutrition. Now, the causes of malnutrition are complex, as are the consequences. So, once again, when we're talking about complexity, we, we need systems, approaches, and frameworks, as we talked about in the last couple of days. So here is a framework that, that attempts to look at the, both the proximate and the ultimate or distal causes of malnutrition. And the basic or underlying causes uh, lie in the social, the economic, and the political context, the reasons why some countries are poorer than others. And that is, you know, there are historical contingent factors, there are factors of geography, there are factors of politics, um, and there are you know, all kinds of other issues that mean that different people have access to different quantities and qualities of food. And this underlying unequal context leads to, in some cases, lack of capital, financial, human, physical, social, and natural. That lack of capital leads to income poverty, um, which, mean, which turns into household food insecurity and also issues with uh, unhealthy household environments and lack of access to health services. So a range of poverty-related factors driven by structural inequalities mean that people get inadequate dietary intake. So that's the traditional area that people, when you think of food security, you think, oh, we must improve dietary intake. But that's not all you have to do. There is also the burden of disease. Now, one of the things with disease is that there's an interaction with dietary in intake. If you are ill, 
you need more food and you need better quality food um, to, to, to survive disease. So people dying of, of um, communicable diseases often are dying of a compound failure of accessing uh, good food as well as the, the, the illness themselves. If you're well nourished, you will tend to live through many infectious disease diseases. And this is why, for example, uh, diarrhea, gastric diseases are a major killer um, of, of children in particular in, in countries where poverty is widespread, um, whereas these are just a, a, an inconvenience for those who are well fed. Um, so dealing with food insecurity means dealing with any of these entry points in the system. So we tend to intervene at the adequate diary intake area, particularly if we're food scientists or nutritionists. Um, but there are these underlying causes which need to be addressed to break the links between uh, poverty and food insecurity and disease. And of course, the, the short-term consequences of, of particularly maternal and child malnutrition, which is the emphasis in this model here, um, death, illness, um, disability. And the long-term consequences, yep. Yeah. Would you not consider, you know, of course, you could address the basic causes. Yeah. But it's very difficult to address the basic causes in a population that has been malnutrition, suffered through malnutrition. Yes. Because they will not really be able to be very productive. Yeah. So, in a sense, it's a cycle. So, if you come in at the dietary level, yeah. you are still you are creating um, possibilities for the next generation to be productive because they will not be have this extra burden of diseases that are related to a condition in childhood. Yes, and I mean what I'm saying is that it's not it's not um, it's not an either or, no. but one of the problems of concentrating only yeah. on that level is that you 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 don't un without addressing the underlying causes, you foster dependency on external food aid, for example, um, or you or you you throw technical um, nutrition solutions at a population that uh, is not going to be able to turn those technical innovations into beneficial nutrition outcomes because of distributional problems and issues that underlie that. Um, so that's why a consideration of the underlying and the other, th and the other uh, areas. For example, your task of feeding people is made much easier if you can also address uh, some of the disease issues. And your success with disease control is much easier if you can address dietary um, insufficiencies. addressing both at the same time, because at the same yep. time she's making efficient more nutrition, she's also making it more valuable. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly, and we'll, we'll come back to that, so yes, yeah. Um, so food insecurity is not just about the inability to produce food, it's also the inability to access it, and most people these days don't produce their own food, they access it through markets. Um, and if you look at this, it shows that um, one of the reasons that uh, poor people uh, fall more easily into food insecurity is that the pro a large proportion of their income goes on food. And so if you get price, rise, um, price increases, for example, um, people will quickly fall into food insecurity. So if you look at, um, at people, for example, in the UK and the US, they spend less than 10% of their household income on food. Whereas um, people in Bangladesh, for example, are spending around 65% of their household budget on food. Um, and there is a relationship with per capita income. There's a scatter, it varies according to the expenditure of other items in, in people's sort of expenditure. Um, but in general, the more, the higher income uh, you have, the, the lower proportion that you spend on food, and therefore the more food secure you are in terms of your ability to access food should food prices go up. No, it's 
proportionally, as a proportional of your income. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I think I think in the US you're spending more on food than you are in Bangladesh. Yes. But as proportional income you're spending five percent. Yes, yeah. that's your your proportion is 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 a slow slow of course of their high income, that's correct. Yeah. But still you do it given that this one to whom I are saying that uh, they are they are producing higher proportion of on, on food and yet they are in addition they are producing they are producing the food which is a you think it is uh ironic. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the measures of food insecurity um, is the IFPRI's Global Hunger Index, which measures, which combines some indexes of uh, health outcomes and, and food availability per capita. And this map shows where um, hunger is, is concentrated and we see that there are areas across um, Central and Southern Africa um, and across the, the Sahel fringe um, and in South Asia that are, are critical areas where the number, and the number of uh, people living in food insecurity is highest and the, and the proportion of people living in food insecurity is highest. So these are not necessarily the lowest income countries there are reasons uh, why uh, access to adequate food um, is an issue. Um, in the case of, of South Asia, this is largely driven by very large inequalities in uh, very large populations, first of all, and then very large income inequalities. So although India, for example, is now moving towards being a middle-income country, very rapidly growing economy, um, that economic growth is not pulling everybody uh, along with it into food security. The converse of people who are underfed is that there are um, almost a similar number who are overfed by definitions of body mass index. Um, so there's about a billion people in the world who are uh, undernourished, and there's about a billion people in the world who are overnourished in terms of calorie count. So nutritionists increasingly talk about uh, Obesity as also malnutrition. It's not undernutrition, but it's malnutrition. It's uh, the wrong type of nutrition. And this usually has been driven by dietary changes and lifestyle changes. So that you get um, an increase in, in people's consumption of uh, saturated fats and highly refined carbohydrates and sugars in the diet. And these are now very cheap on global markets. Um, so this is, and, and you get a reduction in physical activity as people shift from um, manual labor towards kind of office-based work um, and more sedentary lives. And we're seeing the concentration of these in developed countries. Um, you know, this map is now a couple of years old. Uh, the area with the highest um, proportion of the adult population classified as um, obese is now Mexico. Um, it's overtaken the United States. Um, the, what you can't see on this map are the Pacific Islands, where um, there are the highest rates of uh, obesity in the world, but these are, these are sort of small populations. Um, and that's been linked to a shift in diet away from fish towards uh, consumption of uh, fried chicken, uh, mutton flaps, and a, and a shift away from taro root as a staple towards lots of, of white bread and so on. So, um, you know, a, a big shift in diets and, and not necessarily... So these countries are not necessarily rich, and yet the people in them are um, consuming too many calories. So malnutrition has taken on new dimensions. And again, fish has a role to play here in that it's promoted as part of a healthy diet um, and as a substitute for some of the things that are contributing towards obesity and, related, and diseases related to obesity, such as diabetes, which are becoming um, major health burdens for, for some developing and transitional countries. So malnutrition is sometimes called hidden hunger because it's not necessarily associated with um, you know, people being hungry. It's just people's nutrition 
leading to uh, physiological damage. And so an abnormal malnutrition is this, this, um, defined as an abnormal physiological condition caused by deficiencies or excesses um, or imbalances of energy, protein, and other nutrients. Okay, so the imbalances in energy can be both undernutrition and overnutrition. Uh, and the imbalances in nutrients include such things as protein deficiencies and micronutrient deficiencies. Or excess toxins. So how does fish contribute to this world of, of uh, food security, nutrition, and health? Well, it can, food nutrition is, um, sorry, food security is often broken down into three components. The availability of food, people's access to food, and the utilization of that food. Okay, so this diagram kind of divides the uh, contribution of global fisheries in that, in that way. So fish that is available to, to be directly consumed, well, fish doesn't contribute a great deal to the global diet in calorie terms. Okay, it's less than 1% of global cal calorific intake comes from aquatic source foods. There's some variation around, around that. That's probably a lot higher in places like Iceland um, and, and some others. But still, even here, most of calories will be coming from potatoes and uh, other staples and not fish. Fish is, is not a, a major energy-dense food, although it's a nutritious one. In, in protein terms, it is important, and this is very variable according to context, but um, more than 15% of animal protein for more than half the world's population comes from fish. Okay, so that's a significant amount of, um, of the world's population. The other significant factor is that that tends to be uh, the poorer half of the world's population. The, the poorer half of the world's population is, on average, almost twice as fish-dependent as the wealthier half. Um, and fish provides a significant micronutrient contribution. The, the amount is, is something largely unknown because fish are often left out of micronutrient um, surveys and health surveys. But fish it also contributes to food security through the income that it provides to people. Uh, it, it access to fishing opportunities, to fish farming opportunities, doesn't just allow people greater access to fish to eat, it allows them much greater access to fish to sell. And most fisheries and aquaculture systems are not subsistence. Even the small scale ones, even the ones making not much money, are generators of cash income. They're, they're, um, and enable people to get food security through income. And you know, it, you often hear it heard said that fishing communities sometimes don't eat enough fish that because it's, it's too valuable to eat. Uh, you sell it and you buy a cheaper source of, of food. So if, if, you're, if you don't have a farm and, and you're able to fish, you'll catch fish, sell it, and use it to buy basic staple foods, for example. Um, so it supports perhaps 660 to 820 million people around the world. The numbers are very uncertain, um, but that includes the number of people employed in the sector and, and dependent sectors and their household dependents. Um, so that's something around about 8 uh, to 10 percent of the world's population. Fish also contribute to food security through another indirect pathway, through economic growth and, and general poverty reduction. Um, fish production is valuable globally. The trade is um, very large. And these bring local and, e and regional economic multipliers and spillovers, again, which have been difficult to quantify. Yeah. Yeah, the trade is about 100 billion. Um, that is an estimate of first sale uh, value of both. The values that you see of 100 billion um, are often marine fisheries without aquaculture and without inland fisheries. And so that's the three the first sale value of those three areas added together, I think from the uh, FAO report. But um, if it's wrong, please uh, do correct me. I think it's 
την οποία ίσως είναι λίγο κατά τα δεδομένα εξπόρτ των δεδομένων κατά τις αξιοπρέπειες της ΕΕ. Yeah. Okay, but that's an, that's measuring something different. Yeah. yeah. So what yeah. are you measuring the, the total value? Or how, how you... That's the total first sale value of, of fish landings. Um, so, you know, you don't add those to the trade because some of those trade values are encapsulated by first sale values. So this allows for the fact that not all fish is traded. And this is international trade. So the international fisheries trade, the cross-border trade, is worth 102 billion, but more than half of fish is not traded internationally, and so domestic first sale markets uh, add that kind of value. Sometimes when we also express it, we use things like the value, the beach value, the beach value is still at the beach, and then come to the value of the world, and then it has been sold at the end of the day. Would that also capture the, sorry, would that also capture the, like, No, no, um, and I don't think those calculations have ever been made, uh, and if they have, I haven't yet seen them. And there is also the issue of utilization, and many people here work on, on wastage um, and post-harvest losses. In general, in developing countries, the, 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 the wastage is quite consistent across all countries. Um, it, varies around 30%. Um, this is post-harvest. It doesn't include wastages in the water in the form of uh, discarded bycatch and so on. So this, this wastage is from spoilage of fish, in, usually in um, developing countries with uh, infrastructure and uh, with infrastructural challenges. In developed countries, this is often a product of the food marketing system. So our supermarkets and our shops are set up to be constantly full of a diversity of foods. And in order for them to be constantly, to, for you to be able to walk into the supermarket and always find a range of goods, those goods have to be continually replaced. It's no use buying just, a, just enough so that they, they sort of more or less are sold out and if you go in the afternoon, there's nothing left. If you go to the supermarket here in the afternoon, there's the same quantity of food in it as there was in the morning because everything that's being bought is being replaced all the time. So the cost of doing that means that you have to throw around 30% of everything that, that goes through out, the cost of maintaining that. And so a lot of work now is about trying to utilize that waste for animal foods, um, for um, you know, food charity um, and, and so on because it's recognized to be a kind of moral outrage that, that we have hunger and then we throw away food just in order to maintain the profits of our, our food retailing sector and the diverse choice of consumers. I think right, right now in Parliament there's a bill that allows you to sell expired food in the sense that it's past its past selling date. But, uh, especially when we're talking about dry, dry food, you know, and, uh, and canned food. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, there are, gro there are global programs of action now on reducing uh, food waste. And so this has become a major target. Because if you think about it, we're trying to, we're worried about um, feeding an extra third of the world's population. If you had no food waste, it, the job would already be done. So just taking some examples of the way that fish is contributing uh, to food security, it contributes through local markets. Um, locally caught fish, sold locally, consumed fresh um, or, or, or dried and, and distributed through local networks. Looking at the um, example of the, the Western Pacific, um, Johan Bell, a former colleague at, at World Fish and now at the Secretariat for the Pacific Community, did with colleagues an analysis that showed um, the potential threat of the limits of supply to growing populations in, in the Pacific. And this diagram looks at how coastal fisheries 
um, that are currently supplying most domestic production. Their tuna resources are largely exported in this part of the world. And what uh, they found was that the large islands, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, um, Vanuatu, Fiji, and so on, were unlikely to be able to supply their, their current demand for fish let, um, if with increasing populations by 2030. Okay, and this analysis was done a few years ago. Uh, and in many other countries, unless the distribution of fish, for example, inland, improved substantially, they would also, or, or to remote islands, um, there would also be a, de a likely decrease in the per capita availability of fish. And only in a few of the, of the remoter islands um, is there still likely to be adequate fish from the country's own coastal areas. And because many of these countries, apart from the, the valuable tuna fisheries, are rather isolated from trade networks, um, they're unlikely to be to substitute the, the lack of local provision with imported fish. They're at the moment importing other, other food products, and that's contributing to the uh, obesity issues that we discussed a bit earlier. Did he use the 17 kilograms per person? No, he used the, in this case, the current per capita um, demand um, for each country, which differs. Um, so, depending on the cultural preferences for fish in each place. Yeah, there are very small populations in these islands, they're small islands. So they're yeah, um, this is among the more populated area. They're small, but you know, some, of the, some of the population densities are high, and collectively, there's a, a, a quite large number of people. But yeah, in, in general terms, in terms of fish provision, these countries are better off than many other places. So looking at, at fish and then as a, a direct nutrition contribution, it matters what kind of fish you're dealing with, what kind of um, nutrition contribution they provide. So in general, small fish are better, richer contributors of multiple essential micronutrients. And the reason for this is the way that they're eaten. Okay, and I'll come back to that. Um, this is from a series of publications by two nutritionists in the journal Food Policy over the last uh, decade or so. And the fish illustrated here are small freshwater fish from uh, Bangladesh and Cambodia. So if you look at the content, the nutrition content of these fish in terms of some important micronutrients, um, biologically available iron, um, for example, uh, important iron deficiencies uh, are an, an important source of, for example, anemia, um, which is one of the causes of uh, maternal mortality. So the long Latin names are some of these fish, and the bars represent the uh, quantity of um, biologically available iron per milligram, in, in milligrams per gram of fish flesh. And so you'll see that the fish at the top there, the Asomus danricus, is a richer source of iron than even chicken liver, which is traditionally regarded as a, as a particularly rich source. And they're all richer than chicken eggs and spinach, also often commonly promoted as, as rich sources of dietary iron. Similarly, looking at vitamin A, measured by retinal active um, retinal activity equivalent. Uh, vitamin A is, is useful for a variety of things, including eyesight, but um, again here chicken liver is the champion, but um, mola, a small freshwater fish from Bangladesh, uh, has very high quant um, concentrations of vitamin A. It's a very good source of vitamin A. Uh, and some of the other fish also rich, rich compared to vegetables often promoted as being um, important in food nutrition security programs to consume uh, to get sufficient vitamin A. But as I said, it matters which bit of the fish you eat. So this is a map of the distribution of vitamin A in the small fish mola. And you can see where half the fish's vitamin A content is in the eye. So it is important that you eat the eye. And one of the reasons why small fish are more, more nutritious 
is that the whole fish is eaten. The bones provide a source of calcium. For populations who don't drink milk and eat and, and have milk products and have limited access to calcium-rich foods, the bones from, from small fish can be a significant source of calcium. Um, the other second biggest source is the guts. So if you're gutting the fish, you're losing a lot of the nutrition. Okay? So you need to eat the head, especially the eye and the guts, if you want to benefit maximally. <laughs> the other thing is it matters how you cook it. Because depending on the temperature, the treatment, the nutritional quality of the fish um, will change. And I was discussing with somebody this morning, was it with Samuel? About fried fish? Who was I talking to about with fried fish? Stanley. Sorry? Stanley. 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 Sorry, not Sam. Yeah. That, um, you know, in, in Kenya, people are, are selling fried fish. It's becoming increasingly popular as a way of, of, of treating it. And I was talking to a cardiologist um, a couple of months back who looks at the nutritional contribution of fish as a, as a protection against heart disease. And one of the findings of his research was that usually if you fried the fish, you neutralized the contribution uh, to cardiac health because you're shortening the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids which provide that um, protection against heart disease. And you basically, the nutritional content of the fish begins to approximate that of the oil that you're frying it in. And while you're frying that oil, the hotter you're frying it, the, the more you're breaking down those long-chain unsaturated fatty acids and the more short-chain saturated fat you're creating. So you hot fry your fish and it's, um, you can kid yourself that you're having a healthy, nutritious meal, but actually it's probably not doing you that much good at all. Um, unfortunately, fried fish tastes good. <laughs> so you should eat the eye. Um, this was an eye washed up um, on a beach in Florida a few uh, months ago, or last year, I think, and people wondered what it was. And uh, I think it belonged to a swordfish or a large, or a marlin or some large pelagic fish like that. But, uh, yeah, that would be quite a challenge, even to the enthusiastic eater of fish heads, I think. Some of you also may have heard the story in the press recently about um, the El Salvadorian uh, fisherman who was caught in a storm and ended up drifting and surviving alone in a boat. Well, he had a companion who didn't survive, um, but was picked up 13 months later in the Marshall Islands, which was on that map earlier on the other side of the Pacific, having drifted 5,500 kilometers. And he survived by eating, catching by hand, turtles, seabirds, and small fish. And one of the key sources of water for him was the eyes of, of turtles and, and fish that he was eating. The eyes and the blood, and a little bit of rainwater when it rained. He, lived, he, he survived for 13 months. Hmm. There are some people doubt. There's a bit. There's a whole internet debate about people who disbelieve it. So you know, check it out. It's a good story. A, a good story of human resilience. And the 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 evidence seems to be now that uh, he was not lying, um, and that you know this was just a remarkable feat of survival. So, there are, there are technical solutions um, to some of these, uh, these, these problems of, of malnutrition. Um, for example, um, in the vitamin A story in, in Bangladesh, um, you have vitamin A deficiency affecting 25% of the developing world's preschool children. And it's leading to death of approximately uh, 1 to 3 million children per year. And in Bangladesh, in rural households, the small indigenous fish species, like mola, um, are meeting up to 40% of daily requirements of vitamin A. So they're a major source. And these fish live in small flooded areas, um, water bodies called beals, um, but we're now able to cultivate them and culture them. So one of the strategies to combat household um, malnutrition is alongside fish that you sell for the market, such as carp or tilapia, you will also grow in polyculture system 
small indigenous fish species which you use for home consumption because that's you get more nutritional goods so you you have two benefits of fish from food security one through the income that the larger fish that you sell generate and one through direct consumption of the small nutrient rich fish um, in terms of indirect food security for many poor and landless people access to uh, aquatic resources um, provides a means to secure food. Um, some work I did with uh, uh, Nessar Ahmed in, in Bangladesh a few years ago, um, we found that up to 400,000 people, many of them women, like the, uh, the woman pulling a, a seine here, catching a prawn post larvae for sale to um, aquaculture farms. Um, 400,000 people making a living in this way, uh, gaining access to the income that allows them to buy rice and vegetables and proteins. Um, prawns were also contributing through the macroeconomic pathway. They provided at the time uh, Bangladesh's largest, um, I'm saying prawns here, prawns and shrimp, um, both the freshwater and the, and the brackish water, uh, seawater ones provide the largest uh, forex earner after the garment industry. So this um, post larvae fishery was banned, both on, on grounds of trying to conserve the fish resources, because it also catches lots of juvenile fish, um, but also to reduce the risk of disease uh, transmission in shrimp farms. So hatcheries with, with quality uh, assured uh, disease-free larvae help to pre prevent the transmission of, of diseases which have devastated shrimp industries around the world. So disease management and concerns for biodiversity conservation have meant that this source of income is beginning to disappear for people. I think it still happens, does it? Yeah, yeah. but technically it's banned, isn't it? Technically it's illegal, yeah. Okay, so the, the, the major policy arenas then, those are the kinds of contributions that fisheries makes um, to uh, food security in different places in the world, fisheries and aquaculture. Some of the areas of debate um, on what is the best way to um, support the contribution that fisheries and aquaculture make to food security. Well, first of all, does aquaculture enhance food security? It's certainly providing more fish, um, but where is that fish going? And what is its nutrition value? Who's it going to? Who's consuming it? So is the shift that I talked about on the first day towards wealth-based management, away from the sort of more welfare, um, safety net type um, contribution that, that small-scale fisheries make, what's that going to do to the contribution of fisheries to food security? And what about the globalized fish trade? Is it taking fish from the mouths of the poor or putting money in their pockets to buy, buy more food? Or both? Um, is the current concern for marine biodiversity com, uh, cons conservation impacting food security? So there's a big pressure to create marine protected areas. People are touting the ecosystem service values, the, the potential for generating tourism revenue, uh, and the spillover effects of these conservation areas on surrounding fisheries. But there's some evidence that some uh, conservation areas, um, Mar um, Mafia Island Marine National Park has been singled out in a recent publication in this regard that it is decreasing local people's access to nutrition and the evidence in the Mafia Island case in a paper published by some Tanzanian uh, researchers was that rates of child malnutrition had increased as a result of the creation of the marine protected area because people were no longer able to access their local resources um, to, to provide income and, and nutritious food. Um, and the options for land-based production were limited because the quality of the land and the availability of land in this sort of coral island is, is quite limited. Um, and also, how can freshwater fish contribute to food security when everyone else wants the water they swim in for something else? So the pressure on water resources these days is immense. Water is being abstracted for irrigation to keep crop um, production in line with increasing demand for food. 
we're abstracting more water for industrial and domestic and urban use. Um, we're damming it for hydropower. We're doing all kinds of things that reduce the uh, so-called ecological flows available to natural fisheries production. And when you look at the contribution of freshwater fish, it's often very, very high. So if you look at countries like Bangladesh, like Cambodia, uh, Uganda, Malawi, the, the um, fresh, freshwater fish is the primary source of fish. And fresh waters can be more productive per unit area than, than most marine systems. Um, so freshwater fisheries are even more often forgotten in food systems analysis than marine fisheries. But potentially more important to um, many of the highest fish consumption consumers in the poorest areas. People always single out small island states and oceanic states and saying, oh, you know, people in this place, they eat loads of fish, they depend on fish. But if you live in the Amazon basin or if you live in the inland Niger Delta um, or around the Great Lakes, you're also consuming high quantities of, of fish. And the Mekong Basin in particular in Southeast Asia. So turning to aquaculture then, does it enhance food security? Well, it's growing fast and it's supplying a lot of fish. It's responsible for um, the recent increases in per capita global fish availability from around 14 kilos uh, per person per year a decade ago to around 19, 20 uh, kilos per person per year globally at the moment. Impressive as aquaculture's growth is, when you look at, um, if you take all the countries in the world, and you map them on a per capita GDP um, axis against fish protein as a proportion of animal protein, and you select the countries where fish make up more than 20% of, the, of animal, uh, animal protein, and countries that are earning less than $2,000 per capita GDP a year, in other words, the poor and more fish-dependent countries, and you look at where they're getting their fish from, you get a an interesting picture. Basically, the bluer these dots, the more people are still getting their fish from capture fisheries. So dark blue is, 100, is up to 100% um, from capture <coughs> fisheries. The paler, the yellower those dots, the more the fish are coming from aquaculture. So when you look at these countries, the poorer ones, the more fish-dependent ones, overwhelmingly, people are still getting fish from wild fisheries, not from aquaculture. Uh, but this is almost exclusively from Africa. <laughs> 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 yeah? And? Traditionally, you know, the aquaculture is, is, you know, is, is on Asian. And they're doing better. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. 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 So, but, so if it's something we can do something about. Yeah. We, we've reframed it. To, to, to make you think in a different way, instead of thinking, well, Asia equals aquaculture, Africa equals capture fisheries, we're saying high, fish depend high proportion of fish, low income. Yes, what happens is that a lot of the countries that fall into that category globally are in Africa, which again is another surprise to people, because people always say, well, you know, Pacific Islanders and Asians eat lots of fish. And Africans don't eat much, because in absolute quantities they don't, but then because they're not eating much of anything. You know, food intake in many poor African countries is lower than it is in other countries. So what this does is it takes relative uh, importance rather than absolute quantity. So actually it doesn't matter how much fish you eat if you're eating tons of everything. Because if you lose that fish, there's plenty of other stuff to eat. But if you're eating a lot of fish, or if, if a large proportion of the healthy, nutritious part of your, micronutrient-rich part of your diet is fish, and you're losing it, or it's threatened by lack of management, for example, of, of capture fisheries, then, you know, you're going to have people in nutritional trouble. So what this does is it refocuses on the nutritional importance of capture fisheries to um, lower-income countries with um, fish-dependent populations. And one of the outcomes of that reframing of the question is that you get a lot of African countries. 
And so managing capture fisheries for nutrition and food security in Africa becomes a policy priority, whereas at the moment there is an export orientation, a global export orientation, which is the preoccupying policy for many African states. Um, and the small fisheries, the small-scale fisheries, the inland fisheries are not particularly a policy priority. There's also a policy priority on aquaculture development, but that's some way in the future. The really important thing is to manage those small-scale fisheries so people can continue to get access to an important food source. This is the argument made in this paper, and saying that when you consider the goals of fishery governance, fishery management, you have to consider food security. And so that's a paper in a, a journal called The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which, by the way, is pretty hard to get into. Um, the size of the dot also indicates the relative size of the contribution. Uh, sorry, the, the relative size, uh, the proportion of the populations that are undernourished. So the larger the dot, the larger the proportion of people in that country is undernourished. So there's a lot of information on this, on this graph. It bears some, some further study. And there is also the position on the axis, the trade balance. Okay, so these countries on the left are net importers. Those on the right uh, are net exporters. And you'll see that they're kind of scattered um, across there. So some of the countries that have important um, domestic fisheries are also major exporters. Others are, are importers. The point that Toomey just made, um, fish supply in Africa is, and this is a few years uh, out of date now, um, but it, it looks at how ch fish changed in the 1990s um, up to the early 2000s, fish per capita supply. So globally, um, fish per capita supply increased by 43%, almost 44% in that 12-year period. Uh, much of that increase was uh, attributed to, to the, the very large increases that were being reported from China. There were some doubts in FAO about the um, validity of the Chinese statistics, so the calculation was done both with and without the, the contribution of China. But even without the contribution of China, there was a 15% increase in the world fish mm -hmm. supply, largely driven by aquaculture growth. So if you look at all those places, North Africa, Oceania, Europe, South Asia, all showing increases in per capita supply. There are two exceptions, Sub-Saharan Africa, where per capita availability of fish decreased during this period. Population is growing, Cap um, capture fisheries are not growing fast enough to meet demand, and aquaculture is not stepping into the gap, and neither are imports. So people get less access to fish. Um, per capita supply of fish was also decreasing in the U.S. Not such a big issue because, in general, people in the U.S. had plenty of other good and nutritious food to eat if they wanted it. Part of this was also that aquaculture was not growing in North America, partly, partly there due to policy. Um, the potential of the salmon industry was very con constrained by the iconic nature of what the wild salmon populations of the Pacific Northwest. People are very anti-aquaculture. And now people are happy to import farmed fish from other countries, um, but the, you know, many of the, the potential sites are, you know, people don't want to use them. So the US similarly is, is now managing its capture fisheries very efficiently, but in doing so it's also increasing its imports from other countries. So it's passing on its demand uh, to other countries. Now that's good in, in that it provides markets for growing aquaculture trade around the world. Um, but you know, it is this, again, example of how systems are linked um, through trade and through, uh, so local policy choices have consequences outside of the immediate site that you make the decisions. So, we've seen this rapid rise of aquaculture. Um, will it be a blue revolution like the green one? Um, can it have the same transformative effect that the, the green revolution had in Asia in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s? Um, 
here's a study that was done by the World Fish Center on improved tilapia, GIFT it's called, genetically improved fish tilapia. Um, the acronym causes a little bit of panic because genetic improvement and genetic modification are often confused in the public eye. This is conventionally bred, it's not genetically engineered, um, but it's genetically improved because that's what conventional breeding does. So it grows faster. It ut utilizes feed more efficiently. And its dissemination has, it has been estimated, um, improved the livelihoods of, and, and access to fish of perhaps 20 million people. It's been adopted in 68% of tilapia farms, in, uh, in this case it's the Philippines. Uh, it produces a very strong uh, economic in return on, its, on the investment in it, and uh, the yield gains are pretty spectacular. It's produced 186% more food um, than if you had, had continued to use uh, unselected tilapia. It's cuts down on costs, and it's led to a massive increase in tilapia consumption in the region. Okay, so it's a success. Yep. The Green Revolution. Here, here are some figures um, for comparison. If you looked at yields um, per hectare in different countries at the, in the 1960s, in the US it was about a ton per acre. Apologies for the figures. I think this is from an American source, the Gates Foundation. They, they still think in... Um, and that's, that's an imperial ton, not a metric ton. Um, so the US had the highest... Um, grain production rates, and it has also increased them. But look at the spectacular increases in China and India um, over that period from 1960 to 2007. What is of concern is that the same yield gains in staple crops um, were not seen in Africa. So the Green Revolution didn't have that transformative impact. We're starting to see higher yielding maize varieties and things. So the investment in agricultural technologies is what led to this, but it also meant it also had to go into a system which um, was able to absorb that markets worked sufficiently well, that input markets were available, that fertilizers were sufficiently available and affordable, and so on for it to work. And those conditions were not there at the time um, in Africa, and conditions since in global markets have changed. So. It's hard to replicate this, but um, a lot of investment in, Af in Africa is now about trying to improve staple grain yields. Um, similar investments in, f in breeding technology for fish could lead to similar uh, yield gains. At the moment, we're doing very little genetic improvement in aquaculture. Is anyone here doing this? Somebody was doing um, breed improvement, weren't they? Yeah. That's right, yeah. Um, it's probably going to be the next uh, frontier in, in aquaculture development. That and closed circuit or uh, recirculating systems. Integrated, closed, land-based aquaculture, which deals with some of the issues about diseases and, and site uh, limit, limitations. I talked yesterday about whether, you know, this potential blue revolution um, and the better management of fish stocks that we need to preserve the, the contribution that capture fisheries make to nutrition. Would the changing climate challenge our efforts to improve the availability of fish? And the answer from the modeling work that I showed you uh, suggested that, no, it, we would be able um, to maintain per capita supplies. One of those preconditions um, was that fisheries would be well governed, that would, the, the supply of wild fish could be maintained, that we would stop the apparent decline um, in the yields of wild fisheries. And some people may see that as a bit optimistic, but if you look around the world, here is a map of um, some successful case studies drawn from a recent synthesis of the literature in places where co-management arrangements are working, or marine protected areas, 
or territorial use rights or catch share in ITQ fisheries. So there's a big plus by Iceland there. Um, catch share ITQ fisheries are working to um, conserve Icelandic fisheries and the economic contributions that they make. So we're doing a better job of managing wild fisheries. Um, you hear in the newspapers, crisis, 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 but um, there's a lot of quiet success going on in, in the middle of that um, apparent crisis. Okay, so that's part of the policy picture. Let's focus in now on, finally, the health risks and benefits of, of fish consumption. As part of the work that we did for Rockefeller Foundation, we synthesized the medical literature on is, good fish, is fish good for you, is eating too much fish dangerous for your health? We couldn't do absolutely every ramification and claim, but we did quite a lot of them. I want to emphasize before we talk about always health and income, that food is to, most, to all of us about more than just nutrition and income. It's part of our culture, it's part of our identity. We use food to celebrate, we use food um, to, um, to share, to define our families, to, uh, food serves all kinds of social and cultural functions. And so that is why we're not just eating nutrient-rich pills. We still want and value a diversity of food. We want and value the food that we're used to, that, identify, that we can identify with. Some of you may be puzzled by some of the things that are eaten here in Iceland, but they've grown up with these things, and they're important to them. Um, some of maybe what you eat would puzzle an Icelandic person. <laughs> so this proverb really just emphasizes that in some cultures, fish is central to um, the culinary culture, and the food consumption culture of, of, of the place. And people's different diets uh, are also, you know, part of cultural heritage. The, the so-called Mediterranean diet has recently been declared by UNESCO as um, intangible cultural heritage of global significance. I think you ought to get the Icelandic, the traditional Icelandic diet put up there as well. Yep. <laughs> um, and in many cultures that are uh, worried about the quality of nutrition, people are now looking to eat the Mediterranean way because it's recognized that, you know, this food system, and it's, it's a whole food system, it's the way that food is produced, it's the way that it's distributed, it's the way that it's consumed and retailed is part of the whole system. There's a danger that if you only take the, the nutritional, um, you know, compositional message, and ignore the rest of the food system, that you kind of miss the point of its sustainability and desirability. Um, if you start producing these things through different kinds of production systems, and if, if you start retailing them through different kinds of retail systems, then maybe you lose some of the value of the whole package. So again, when you're t kind of transforming value chains, these are some of the issues to bear in mind, um, that people's dietary preferences, nutritional goods, cultural preferences, um, and economic efficiencies and economic modes of production co have co-evolved. And so you, you kind of have to understand the ramifications of changing parts of them um, for the rest of the system. And systems are quite resilient and they adjust. And the Mediterranean diet will probably still look more or less like this in a thousand years' time. Um, but it might, we might have to grow things in different places because the Mediterranean is likely to be suffered suffering drought uh, in future. So some of this will have to be imported to keep it, to keep it going. But it's rich in vegetables, legumes, uh, fruits and nuts. Olive oil is a key component, a long chain, uh, poly, uh, unsaturated um, fatty acid containing. Fish is a key component, uh, and red meat is a minor component. And this is a kind of message that's been put to those cultures that have become very dependent on red meat and meat consumption goes up with per capita income. So you're seeing that, you know, in a culture where a meat, meat, eating meat is a luxury, when you become rich, what do you want to do? You want to consume luxury, and that means consuming meat. Okay. So we did a synthesis of 
all the effects of omega-3, one of the critical components of oily fish, and the one that people always say, well, omega-3 is good for your health. Evidence that it's good for your health is, um, can be seen in the person of Tumi Thomason here, who eats cod liver oil every day. He's actually 123 years old, and look how well. <laughs> you need no more proof, but here is uh, the study from hundreds of randomized controlled trials, um, trials done under a sort of approved medical protocols. So we've discarded here anything that is not a proper medical trial, anything that's a random uh, anecdotal observation like the one that I just made about Tumi. Um, so the number of trials that are included in each of these is, is given in the size of the circle. Um, the White circles are where omega-3s were not effective for what they uh, were looking at, and the blue ones are where omega-3 was, was definitely um, effective, and the others are where the results are uh, a little bit mixed. Okay, so there's conclusive evidence. The biggest amount is... Um, that there is almost always a positive trade-off between the benefits and the risks of omega-3 intake. So omega-3 sources, oily fish, also contain potential toxins. But in most of these randomized control trials, the, the health benefits outweighed the health risks. Uh, and there's good evidence um, that omega-3 was effective in treating inflammation of joints, for example, uh, the treatment of arthritis, reduction of risk of cardiovascular disease, of which there's been a, a, a quite a big debate, um, but a lot of conclusive evidence. Um, improves your blood pressure. Um, treatment of various metabolic disorders in children. No evidence um, that it changes the risk of diabetes um, or that, that helps prevent Alzheimer's disease, which some people have been claiming. Okay, um, limited evidence. Um, of Or mixed evidence of some of the other claims that have been made. Okay, but there's enough evidence there that um, both from systematic reviews and randomized control trials that um, Eating oily fish is good for you. I talked the other day about uh, the controversies in fish trade and food security, whether trade was taking fish uh, away from the poor. And we examined a couple of countries to show that the picture of whether this was actually happening was rather mixed. So we did a preliminary analysis um, of the relationships between fish production and trade um, in a 15-year time series for about 50 countries that we could get data for. So again, this is a synthesis of a lot of, a lot of information in one graph. So, and we've also used the colored dots system to say whether this was coming from aquaculture or not. So the graph is divided into four quadrats. This bottom quadrat here is where you have decreasing exports of fish and also decreasing availability of fish domestically. So these are places where fish is neither um, sh showing increased exports, nor is it increasingly being consumed domestically. And we have uh, areas of concern, Malawi, uh, Liberia, and uh, a couple of others here at the margins. So the countries at the top there are where People are eating more fish domestically, but exports have been decreasing. And in that case, it looks like people are prioritizing domestic consumption over export. Okay, so the Gambia, Cameroon, uh, and they're getting it mostly from capture fisheries in all of these cases. In the places um, where there are... These countries here are increasing their exports, but domestic availability is decreasing, so people are consuming less fish. So in these countries, you might say that exports are leading to a reduction of fish availability. 
And a lot of these are African countries. So the concerns that people have that Africa is exporting its fish and not producing enough domestically to make up for that export uh, is a legitimate one. If fish is a crucial part of people's diets. Now, in some of those countries, it's maybe not, uh, and there are other sources of protein. But you know, it is an area perhaps to look at. Again, this analysis is quite crude, doesn't disaggregate different groups of people, um, but you know, it's a starting point for, for that debate. And what you'll see is that most of the countries that have substantial aquaculture, that their production comes either nearly half or, or uh, more than half from aquaculture, are the ones which are both increasing their exports and increasing their domestic consumption. Okay? So it's aquaculture that's driving increased fish availability for export and for domestic consumption. So where you have aquaculture, you resolve that dilemma of whether to export your fish or to eat it dom domestically. Because what it tends to do is it drives an increase in production um, that spills over from export-orientated aquaculture into domestically orientated um, farming systems as well. So it's like a triple win. You get more money, you export from exporting more fish, it drives a domestic aquaculture and it helps you uh, to maintain your domestic um, supply. So I kind of put this one in a bit f facetiously. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the culture of lolcats. If you're not, go and Google it. It's a subcultural phenomenon. Um, but I use this slide to uh, challenge my colleagues in developing countries who say things like, oh, you know, the problem with food security is these poor people, there's too many of them, they're having too many children. And I said, well, okay. Um, and and they, they advocate sort of education for birth control and things like this. So, yeah. If you had less people, there'd be less, it'd be easier for us to conserve fish. Um, so you could lower the human demand for fish with strict management, so only the rich can afford it, which is kind of the hidden message in some areas. You could support coercive birth control, or you could get rid of all the cats. Um, and I used the example, and when I presented this, um, I didn't know at the time that the director of the laboratory I was presenting it in was Australian. Um, and it's the place of my future employment. So my first uh, act in my job was to threaten to castrate my future boss. <laughs> it's probably not a good move, but I still got the job. Um, so Australian humans eat about 11 kilos of fish per capita per year. Australian cats eat more than that. Um, and there are almost as many cats as there are humans in Australia. Okay? So there's... It gives you an idea when we talk about these fish consumption flows that you've got to sort of consider the other value chains. We always talk about fish meal for farming and, and uh, it comes back into the food chain, the human food chain indirectly. But, you know, this is not coming back into the food, uh, the human food chain indirectly in most cases, unless you eat your cat. So um, the... Number of, of domestic cats um, were estimated as consuming um, around 6% of globally traded fish. And the fur and the pet trade, uh, an additional 7.5%. Okay? Um, fish farming, the biggest, the biggest consumer of, the, of, of fish meal. But basically, what this study by Senna de Silva and, uh, and his colleague um, highlighted was that you know, we use fish in these other, other ways. And there are really ethical choices about what to use fish for. And policy needs to make those, those kinds of choices. Um, and we need to understand these trade-offs if we're going to make prescriptive policies about what fish should and shouldn't be used for and how much fish people should and shouldn't eat. So part of this, and I mentioned this the other day, part of this um, effort to try to get the connections between different parts of the global um, fish as food system aligned with policy and with the ethical choices about how to make best use of this, of this resource for human welfare, human well-being, um, while balancing that with the, with the 
the needs for uh, environmental conservation. And so to try to sort some of this out, um, there's a project which I was involved in at the very start, but not much since, um, run out of Stirling University in the UK uh, and funded by the European Union, and the website is up there. And it was aiming to develop a sustainable ethic aquatic trade index, hence it's called the SEAT project, S-E-A-T. Um, and it really tried to, to take value chain approaches, um, life cycle assessment approaches, and product safety and standards, and also add ethics and welfare um, to that mix to try to really understand what the best way to produce farmed fish was, how we could use policy um, and use management to drive the whole global fishery system towards greater sustainability and fairer allocation. Okay, so in conclusion then, um, to the business of governing fisheries and aquaculture for food security, um, we, in order to do that, we need to add an ethical dimension to policy that's not there at the moment. The moment we, we make our decisions on the basis of economics and ecology, but not of what is right, what, we, what society thinks is a good thing to do, and that is the domain of ethics. Okay, it's not something that we think about very much, but it's perhaps something that we should. And you'll increasingly see ethics coming into public choice um, models of policy evaluation. What is the right thing to do? Um, fisheries and aquaculture can be environmentally sustainable sources of human food. I think that needs to be emphasized in a climate where aquaculture and fisheries both receive a lot of criticism. Um, the crisis narrative in fisheries, that you know, we're plundering the oceans, all of that stuff. If we didn't plunder or use the oceans as, as much as we can, we'd have to grow more food on land, more cows, more sheep, and then we'd move the problem to somewhere else. So keeping the sea as wilderness um, won't help us conserve the land. Uh, it won't help feed us either. Um, having said that, there are areas of the sea that deserve protection that, that society wants to, wants to protect um, and that can be set aside, for example, in marine protected areas um, because the resources there are, are valuable um, and uh, every other thing on this planet has a, has a right to, to life as we do. So fisheries and aquaculture can be environmentally sustainable. Um, the health benefits in general outweigh the consumption risks. And fish is, is traded globally, and this can benefit food security if we keep a close eye on that trade to make sure that it doesn't deprive people of uh, access to healthy food. Um, there's a lot of scope for improving efficiencies, and a lot of the work that this group is doing is about improving the efficiencies in production, access, and distribution of fish. And that's kind of where the work that you do fits into this, this bigger picture. So I hope, um, again, that that's you know, given us a united framework within which we're all working and thinking um, as we go about the very important work that, uh, that you're all doing here. So I wish you the best of luck with that work. Um, I've been hearing about it for the last um, three days, and there's an amazing range of projects. Um, really interesting and exciting, innovative and, and useful te technical um, and policy work there. Um, so good luck finishing your assignments, and thanks very much for your uh, participation in, the, in this week. Thank you. <laughs>